The living God, only you, only you have the power. Only you deserve the glory. Only you are on the throne of eternity. And no one and nothing can cast you off. And so we pray that today as we open your word, as we grapple with the words that you, Jesus, spoke to the church in Thyatira, as we think about what you have to say to us today, will you open our hearts to receive? Will you allow us to come with humility, understanding that in this world, there's so many things swirling around, so many things being thrown at us, and yet you spoke and the heavens and the earth came into existence. You made a way for us to be cleansed of sin and to be redeemed. You have loved us before we loved you. So may your truth and your word and your spirit guide us today and lead us into both grace and truth as we walk with Jesus, you, Jesus, the Lord of grace and truth. Speak to us today, we pray, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Well, we are in week four of a nine-week journey walking through the book of Revelation, and we're using uh, the letters to the churches in chapters two and three to kind of springboard us into the rest of the book of Revelation, the big themes that God wants to come alive in our hearts. And today we, we land on a theme that, that showed up also in the letter to the church of Pergamum that showed up in another place uh, in the book of Revelation chapters two and three, but it's, it's a big theme, it's an important theme, and it's a challenging theme, and it's simply identifying and resisting false teaching. That anyone who's come to the cross and received Jesus, anyone who's had the Holy Spirit move into them and become his, his, the follow, a follower of Jesus, a Christian, anyone who's seeking to follow and live out the words of this book, the Bible, that we should learn to identify and resist when something is contrary to God's word. And there's plenty of stuff coming at us every single day that's contrary to God, God's word. From our culture, from the world, from friends, sometimes in our own, from our own heart. Sometimes from people who, who bear the name Jesus but are speaking things that aren't consistent with the word of God. And so today I'm going to invite you to open your heart. If you're a follower of Jesus, would you open your heart to say, God, I want to understand your truth and hear you speak to me, even if you challenge me with some of the things that I think are true. Because in our world today, people will say to you, well, you know, I have my truth, you have your truth. There's, there's no such thing. There, there's the truth. There's God's truth, and he is, Jesus came as the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. His word is true. And if I built my life on this idea, well, I'm going to just come up with whatever, whatever my truth is and live by it. Let me tell you, when I was in junior high, I had a certain truth. <laughs> I wasn't a Christian, and I lived by it. It was a mess. If you or I come up with our truth, we're going to be in trouble. We have to go with the truth, his truth, the truth of Jesus. And, and false teaching is dangerous. Jesus is saying to the church of Thyatira, also the church of Pergamum, all, throughout all the churches, he's saying, you have to know me, know my truth, and resist the false things that come your way. And, and Jesus gives this warning. And I, let me ask you, do you think that, that teaching that's wrong can be dangerous? Do you recognize it? What, what, if, what if somebody said to a little, a little boy or a little girl, a little boy or a little girl came in and they saw a box of rat poison and they said, Daddy, Mommy, what is this? And the dad or mom said, oh, that's candy. It's delicious. Is that a problem? It's not true. It's a lie. But they're teaching something that's false. Is that, does that have consequences? What's the answer? Yes, fa false teaching. Well, well, that's obvious. Is there, is there anything else that's maybe not, not, not so obvious? Well, here's one. And this is going around our world today. If someone disagrees with you, they're the enemy. And you should not talk with them or even be around them and cut off from them. I've talked to more people that are having divided relationships and family and with friends because they bought this lie that just because someone disagrees with you, you can't have a relationship with them. If that was true, I wouldn't be married anymore. Because sometimes my wife disagrees with me, and sometimes I disagree with her. But I always love her. But there's this lie going around. If you don't agree with people, then you hate them. You're the enemy. You can't be in a relationship with them. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It really is. And Satan delights in division. If, if I didn't have a friendship with people I disagree with at times, I wouldn't have any friends. I wouldn't even be my own friend because sometimes I disagree with myself. You know, I mean, there's times where I look at me a year ago and me now, I, go, I don't know if I always agree with me. And so there's all these things that can go floating around. Uh, here's another one. You know, there, there, there's, there's no absolute truth. There's only relative truth. That's a lie. 
There is, and God establishes what's absolutely true, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so as we walk through this letter to the church, uh, we, we really want to uh, grapple with inviting God to speak to our hearts. And so what you're going to, as I read this passage, and if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. And we'll have, the, we'll have the, the passage on the screens, whether, whether you're at home or in the courtyard or in the family worship venue or in here. They'll be up on the screens. But I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to open it up. If you have a Bible app, to open it up to Revelation chapter 2. And as I walk through this passage, I want you to notice two things. One, I want you to notice that Jesus is, is both affirming and challenging. So notice where Jesus affirms and notice where he challenges. But here, here's the big thing that I want you to notice. As, as, you, as I walk through this passage, I want you to notice how Jesus feels about false teaching. Because it's Jesus speaking to the church. How does he feel about false teaching? So look with me at Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God. This is Jesus speaking. These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. And here's what Jesus says to the church. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance. Man, you're hanging in there. And that you are now doing more than you did at first. Just pause there for a minute. Do you see how Jesus begins? He says there's five different things he wants to say to his children, to his church. I see these things that you're doing. These are good things. Your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. I see your good deeds. He celebrates those. He does that with you and me. He wants us to know when we're walking with him and he, he delights in that. But then there's a nevertheless in verse 20. And it kind of turns, turns on this hinge of the never, nevertheless. And now Jesus says, I love these things about you, but there's something else going on that if you don't deal with it, it could corrupt all the rest of it. So Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants, the people of God, into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Jesus says, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching, and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's a lot there. It's an intense passage. And Jesus begins, I bless this, I bless this, I bless this, I bless this, I bless this. And it's growing. I celebrate that. Nevertheless, there's false teaching going on. And it's destroying people's lives. It's destroying the church. And so Jesus addresses it. Now I want to be really clear as he says, this woman, you know, there's this woman Jezebel who's teaching false things. It pro her name probably wasn't Jezebel. Jezebel was the name of like the worst woman character in all the Old Testament. Ahab's wife, she, she tried to destroy the prophets. He, he's, he's probably saying she has kind of like a Jezebel spirit. She's acting like Jezebel did. And we'll talk more about, as he talks about her children, her children are probably her followers, people that are buying into what she's teaching. But, but we have to understand the seriousness with which Jesus takes this. But, but he's, he deals with Jezebel here, but if you go back to the, to the letter to the church in Pergamum, he deals with the teaching of Balaam that Balak taught him, and same issues, food sacrifice to idols, sexual immorality. Also, the teaching of the Nicolaitans comes up twice in the letters to the churches. And so there's, there's false teachers, both men and women. They're in the church, and they're teaching things that do not honor God, that aren't true to Scripture. And it's destroying the church. It's taking the good things that God is doing them, and it's, bringing, bringing, it's, it's, it's damaging all of those things. And, and so as we look at this, this, this church here in the city of Thyatira, 
Um, it's, it's what I call an ordinary church, an ordinary city with extraordinary challenges. Just a little history and context in this particular area. The city of Thyatira is a city where uh, there was lots of trades, trades in the, in the, in the bronze world, in, in uh, weaving, all these different kind of, you know, kind of hand working of different things, lots of trades, and every trade had sort of a, a, a patron god or goddess and had an idol connected to it. And they had kind of a guild or a union. It'd be almost like a, a modern-day union, but it'd be like a guild. So there'd be like the bronze worker guild. And if you worked in the bronze, work with bronze, you were kind of part of that guild. And then when they would gather, you'd have festivals and eat food, sacrifice to the idol, the false god of the bronze guild. And that was true for all the guilds. So there's this complicated thing where I'm, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in that, but when I walk into the workplace, there's stuff that they're trying to have me do that goes against what I believe. Has the world changed at all? No, whether you're in a school, a workplace, a neighborhood, sometimes in a family. When I became a Christian, I was in a non-believing, I was in an atheistic family. So there were things my family believed and held to that I didn't believe. But that was part of the challenge in Thyatira is that, is that there's, there's all these things going on in the city and then it's starting to creep into the church. And people are teaching things that are inconsistent with the word of God. It was a radically secular culture that made it difficult to be a Christian. And I think we still live in that. I think in every, every chapter of history, that's kind of the reality that people face. And there's something going on where, where Jesus is addressing the church. And again, Jesus, the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. It's Jesus. He, he speaks the truth to this church. And I'm going to show you a picture now. Just, in just a moment, I'll ask her to come on the screen. And here's what I want you to do. When you see this picture, I want you in one word to define what the problem is. What is this picture trying to, it's trying to solve a problem. Okay, look at the screens here. Look at your screen at home. Here's the picture. Now, when you see that, you probably don't think, oh, they're having a carnival. Let's invite over the neighborhood kids and have them go inside of there because that would, the kids could die. What, in one word, what's the problem? Termites. We all, it's not like, oh, that's festive. Isn't that nice? Nobody wants one of those things over their house, right? But, but that's, that, I think that's the picture of the church where Jesus is saying, be careful, because false teaching can become like termites. You don't really notice it, but it's, it's eating away at the foundations. And eventually, a church just collapses. Or I've seen entire denominations collapse, because they start to compromise on what this book says. Can I tell you, as a pastor, if I didn't believe this book was true from beginning to end, I'd be doing something else. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that this was the, the Holy Spirit breathed word of God. And that the best and only way to live a life that truly flourishes and has meaning and depth is to follow God's ways. I believe that with all my heart. If I didn't, I would pack it up and I would do something else. And I hope for you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you understand that knowing the word of God and following it is the way to the best life, the healthiest life Everyone struggles, everyone battles with sin, but surrendering to Jesus and following him is so important. And that's why Jesus speaks to this church and challenges them. And so as we walk through the book of Revelation, we're kind of, we have kind of these three movements where we talk about, we're trying to get, get a picture of what's going on, kind of see the vision. And in a moment, we're going to look at that vision of Jesus with his eyes like blazing fire, his feet like burnished bronze. And what did that mean? So we kind of get in the picture. Then get the message. What's God teaching? What's the message God wants us to hear? Okay, how is God speaking to us through the message of scripture? And then third, get a, getting a move on it. Doing something, how does it impact our life, change how we live? So a vision of what God is saying, the message of what God is saying, and then action based on what God is saying. So we're going to begin with getting a picture, getting the picture, a vision that's happening here. So in verse 18, we read these words. This is, this is how the letter of the church of Thyatira begins. To the angel of the church of Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. These are the words of the Son of God. In all the other letters of the churches, Jesus never used that particular name. He has lots of names. And through the different letters, he does different pictures of him or images of him. But in this one, he says, the Son of God. Why? Because in the ancient world, the emperors were called the Son of God and were considered divine. And in the city of Thyatira, it's a place where there was particularly the cult of Apollo. Apollo was a pagan god, the god of the sun. And so, so Jesus says, these are the words of the Son of God. Not your emperor, not Apollo or the son of Apollo that they worshiped, but Jesus. And then he goes on. Whose eyes are like blazing fire. 
whose eyes are like blazing fire. Well, Apollo is the sun god. And here's Jesus. He's saying, you may worship the emperor, you may worship Apollo, you may worship the son of Apollo, but I am the son of God, and my eyes are like blazing fire. And my feet are like glowing, burnished bronze in a furnace. Well, there were a lot of bronze workers in that city. They could picture the power, the authority, the glory of Jesus. And we should picture that in our minds. Remember the first week of this series in Revelation, I talked about the fact that we're supposed to see Revelation, not just hear it. That, that John says, you know, blessed are those who read aloud the word of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it. You know, we need to, we, we, why, why out loud? Because it's, it's like a dramatic movie that John saw this vision and we should be captured by that vision. I hope that many of you have read through or listened through the whole book of Revelation kind of in one sitting as one epic drama. You don't, you don't watch a movie in 15 parts. You watch it in one sitting. The book of Revelation, and Pastor Sean actually said, he said, you know, I listened to it on my phone. I, I got, he had his uh, Bible app on his phone, free Bible app, Bible Gateway. He said, I listened to it, it was 59 minutes, not even a full hour. And I had heard the whole book of Revelation. He says, I listened, I could picture it in a fresh new way and see the whole storyline and the glory of Jesus. And so his eyes are like blazing fire that he sees piercing through all things. And, and, and that's, that's the glory of our God. And then the picture we should have is, is not only the glory of Jesus, the Son of God, eyes like blazing fire, feet like burnished bronze, but also to see how he sees the people. Jesus says, these, he says, I see in you, as I look at you through my piercing eyes, I see the goodness in you, that you are my people, you are my followers. So he says, I, he says I, these, are, these are good people who are really trying to follow Jesus. He says, I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. I know your love. I know your faith. I know your service. You're serving so faithfully. Perseverance, you're hanging in there. It's a tough time of persecution. You're hanging in there. And that you're now, Jesus, you're now doing more than you did at first. So, so you're loving and you're faithful and you're serving and you're persevering more and more. Let me pause there for a minute. If you are a follower of Jesus, and you don't hear Jesus saying to you, you don't know in your heart that he looks at you and he delights. He says, I see your faithfulness. I see you striving to live for me. I know you live in a tough world. I know that there's struggles and temptations and you battle with things, but I see you striving to live for me. Jesus delights in that. You need to hear that. The, the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knows all of our sins. On our worst day, our most rebellious day, Jesus said, I would give my life for you. That's the love of Jesus. You gotta hear that. So when he begins talking to this church and this vision of this church, he says, he says, you know, I know your deeds. I know your love and your faith, your service, your perseverance, and you're doing more than you did at first. I rejoice in that. You need to hear Jesus' words of blessing to you as you follow him, even with your struggles. Because the process of salvation comes when you receive Jesus. The process of sanctification, becoming like Jesus, takes a whole lifetime and, and beyond. And Jesus delights as you strive to live for him. He delights in this church. He celebrates this. Here's a question for you. How do you respond to the spiritual reality that the piercing eyes of the Son of God are focused on you and the bride, his beloved church? How do you feel when you think about that, that Jesus, Jesus, with his, Jesus, the Son of God, with his eyes like, like, like blazing fire, piercing, sees everything we do? Does that bring you comfort and hope? Or does that make you go, oh man, I don't, I don't want to think about Jesus watching me. I remember a conversation that Sherry had with my dad before he became a Christian. My dad became a Christian after a lifetime as an atheist and moving closer and closer to Jesus. A month before he passed away, he became a follower of Jesus. But we had lots of conversations about faith before that. And in one of the conversations, Sherry came out of that conversation, she said to me, man, it was, so I was talking about, to your dad about faith and about Jesus. One of the things my dad had said to her, she said, I just don't like the idea of a God who's just watching me. You know, who knows what's going on. <laughs> so it made, it just, he said, it makes, it's kind of, cre it just, ah, I don't like it. But can I tell you, even with my own struggles and frailties, I'm, st I'm still in the journey of sanctification. I am, I'm, your, I'm your pastor. I am not perfect yet. Ask my wife. Ask anybody who knows me well. My friends, not perfect yet. But striving to be more like Jesus. But I delight that there's never a moment that the eyes of the Son of God turn away from me. He sees me. He knows me. Wherever I go, whatever I do, that brings me comfort. And he even sees me when I'm making dumb choices, when I get mouthy or you know, behaving ways that afterwards I say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be like that. 
He sees me even then. That brings comfort. How do you feel when you know that Jesus looks at you? So first, you know, get, getting, getting, the, get, getting the picture, seeing the vision. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, eyes like blazing fire, feet like glowing bronze, looking upon his church. That's the vision. But then getting the message. Understanding God's truth. We see the picture of Scripture, but what's the message? What is God seeking to say to us and teach us? And, and one of the things he's saying is, he's saying, you know, things can look good on the outside, but not be so good on the inside. You know, you, you can be doing great in certain areas, but all of a sudden you're letting this, there, there's termites, you know, eating away at the foundation of your house. There's, there's false teaching, and you're starting to buy into it in your own life, and this could be costly. So he's warning us. So here's some of the messages that we need to see as we read through this portion of Scripture. Number one, a church to bless and celebrate. That Jesus looks at the church of Thyatira with the false teaching, with the challenges, but he be, begins and says, I see your deeds, I see how you're living, and I bless you. <clears throat> I see that you're growing in your perseverance, you're growing in your love, you're growing in your faith. And Jesus celebrates them. Can you hear that? In the church and in your own life. But, but you don't understand, Pastor, I'm not perfect, I make mistakes. No, I do understand. If we had to kick everybody out of shoreline who isn't perfect, we'd all be gone, including me and Sherry and Brandon. And I could, I could just, you know, we'd all, it's not that we're perfect. It's that we're being made perfect in Jesus. He, we're cleansed through Jesus. We'll stand before a perfectly holy God, and they'll say, you are perfectly holy because of the work of Jesus. But as we walk through this life, we're not perfected yet. We're made, we're made holy in Jesus, and we're growing in holiness. We're becoming more and more like him. And so do you get the message that, 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 that Jesus longs to bless his church and longs to bless his people? And we should receive that and rejoice in that. And then another lesson. There is a nevertheless. That Jesus looks and says, I bless this in you. I love that you're striving in this. You're growing in the word. You're serving faithfully in children's ministry or student ministries. I love that you're leading a Bible study. He says, I rejoice. But he says, but nevertheless. And Jesus wants them to know where the corrosion is happening, where, where the termites are eating through, where things are going to collapse if they don't recognize it. Why is Jesus pointing out where the problem is? Because he loves them. A loving parent doesn't watch their child run toward a cliff and say, have fun, honey. You know, that's not a loving parent. And God loves us. So he blesses what's good, but he shows us where we need to grow. He shows us what needs to change. And we need to listen and receive what he has to say. Nevertheless, he says, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants. God's people are being misled through false teaching into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So Jesus points out two specific areas. And that's the third kind of lesson, the third message we need to hear. And that is this, the problem with tolerating false teaching. And there is a huge, huge danger here if we buy into and follow false teaching. And so I want to address this, and as I've been studying through the book of Revelation, as I've been really praying and reflecting on this, there's something that's kind of unfolded in my heart that I really want you to hear and understand, because I believe that what Jesus is doing here to the church of Thyatira, to the church of Pergamum, to all the churches, and to the church today, is, is he's saying to them, there are battles going on that fight against the very things that God wants for us. And he's not dealing with all the potential sins that people struggle with. He just addresses two because these are two things that kept coming through the false teaching. And I believe that these two areas of spiritual battle actually are an attack against the two primary things that Jesus says we're supposed to be about as Christians. So in, in Matthew chapter 22, and if you want to turn there, you can. If you want to listen, you can listen. But in Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 36, Jesus is has, having this conversation with the religious leaders. And they say to him, Jesus, what's the most important of, of all the commandments, of all the things in all the Old Testament, what's most important? And some of you are already ahead of me. You, you know what Jesus said, but let me read it for you. Teacher, they asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus actually gives them two. Gives two. <clears throat> Here's the response of Jesus. Jesus replied, this is, this is Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all, with, you know, all that you are. This is the first and the greatest commandment. That's number one. Love God with all that you are. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So they say, Jesus, what's the most important of all the commandments? And Jesus says, number one, love God with all that you are. Number two, love people. 
Now the sins that came through the teaching of Balaam, ancient teaching from the Old Testament times, and the sins that came through the teaching of Jezebel and the teaching of the Nicolaitans, these false teachers that were in the first century in these churches that Jesus is addressing, led people to two things, idolatry and sexual immorality. So watch this now. What's the greatest of the commandments? What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, with all that you are. How do you counter that? If you're the enemy, how do you fight against that? Idolatry. Get people to love anything else more than God. Get people to love themselves more than they love God. To love their spouse or their children or their friends more than they love God. To love their political party and their political convictions more than they love God. To love their hobbies, the things they do for fun, more than they love God. To love money more than they love God. Here's the point. To love anything more than you love God and it becomes an idol. So Jesus says, what's most important? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What does the enemy do? He brings false teaching that gets people to commit idolatry, love something else more. And the moment you do, God's not on the throne. And you start, stop living fully the life that God has for you. What's the second commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love people the way you want to be loved. What's one of the primary ways that the enemy devastates relationships between people? He twists and contorts sexuality. Treat people like a sexual object. View people on shows and movies that really treats them like they're nothing other than something to please your lusts and your desires. Sexual immorality is anything that takes sexuality out of the context that God has given. And so Jesus is saying to the church then, and I believe he says to the church today, and as a pastor, I, I have to speak to this, and I want to share these things that I share with you with, with humility and with grace, but with absolute conviction and truth. That, that we have to watch out for idolatry and sexual immorality in our culture today and in the church today. Why? Because Jesus warns the people in the church in the first century of exactly the same things. And so we have to look at this and say, you know, what, what are the points? So Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, with all that you are. And the enemy says, idolatry, love anything else more than you love God. And there's a battle. We have to acknowledge and look and say, man, there's times that I wander. There's times that I love other things more than I love God. Some people say, man, there's, I probably never had a time where I love God first above all and put him on the throne of my whole life. And Jesus says, That's, you want the best life, the most, the most meaningful spiritual life, put God first on the throne. Let no idol come in the way. If there's an idol getting in the way, cast it down. Throw it down and put God where he belongs and you will find life abundant and life full. You will. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you've had those moments where you put God first in your life and you walk with him and you're like, man, the joy, the peace, all that, that fills your soul and all of a sudden you find yourself kind of wandering and, and all of a sudden something else has taken the place and is above God. And you're like, ah, oh, it doesn't feel the same and I don't have the same joy, I don't have the same peace. Well, things have gotten mixed up. So Jesus is saying, don't believe this false teaching. Let no idol take over the place that only God should have. And then the second thing Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love people the way you want to be loved. You want to know one of the greatest ways that the enemy brings devastation to our human relationships. He twists who we are as people, fundamentally. Do you know that when God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible says, now listen to this, this is the, the dignity of this. God says, I created Human beings, God says, in my image, male and female, I created them. The fullness of God's image is, is met in men and women together, reflecting the glory of God. And our world is, and our world is on a full, kind of full-scale attack against gender and sexuality and who we are as people. God says, I created male and female in my image, I created them. The image of God. There's dignity in that. There's power in that. And then the world says, you know, there's no boundaries to your sexuality. Do whatever you want, whenever you want, with anyone you want. doesn't matter. That's where you're going to find joy. It's not true. That's where you find bondage. That's where you find brokenheartedness and emptiness. And so God says, follow my ways and walk in my ways. Keep me first on the throne and also understand as, as, a, as a person, as a man or as a woman, live your life with, with dignity. You know, God gave, and, and this, this is the challenge. You know, God gave a simple but challenging framework for our sexuality. When God created men and women, he said it was very good. When God created like the heavens and the earth, good, trees, good, plants, good, animals, good. It got to man and woman together. You know what God said? Very good. 
That's a, that, that's a gift. And then, that, then we lose that when we, when we forget what God has made and we don't hold to it. And, 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 so, and so God calls us uh, to, to live in, in the way he's made us to live. And as a pastor, one of my challenges is to, to, with grace to speak the truth. Je- the Bible says in the Gospel of John, Jesus came with grace and truth. Grace first, then truth. So in the church, people who struggle with putting things before God, that's a temptation for anybody. I'm going to, as your pastor, encourage you, put God first, put God first, put God first. In our church, when people struggle with sexuality, and there's a lot of that going on in our world, I'm going to say, you know, God's, here's God's design. This is God's design. A man and a woman. In the covenant before God, a, a covenant of Christian marriage that God makes the two one. And within that covenant, sexual expression is an absolute gift and it's absolutely wonderful. When we take it out of that environment, which is where a lot of sexuality is in our world today, it's devastating. It's destructive. And people say, oh, just do whatever you want. It'll make you so happy. But I can tell you as a pastor, it, there are so many people that, have, that feel empty and broken and used because the enemy wants to distort who we are as sexual people. And so as a pastor, I am going to always seek to sh- extend grace. Here's the thing. If, if I said anyone in this church who ever struggles with se- sexual temptation, uh, any, goes out, outside of the man, woman, covenant of marriage, ever, that you're not welcome at Shoreline. As a matter of fact, anybody who does any sin, you're not welcome at Shoreline. We're all gone. Game over. That's not the point. I actually tell people when I talk with them, and I talk to people who, who are living a different life in terms of their sexuality or not putting God first, I'll say to them, listen, as we talk about these things, I'm going to share what the Bible says, and I'm going to tell you that Shoreline's always going to preach the Bible. A lot of people say, do you think Shoreline will ever change its position on this or that or the other thing? I'll say, not unless the Bible changes, <laughs> and the Bible's not changing. We, we're going to hold to God's word, but I say, we will always have grace. I tell people, don't start going to some other church that agrees with whatever you're thinking. If it's, if it's not biblical, stay here and deal with the discomfort of being challenged periodically about things that you don't want to hear, but you need to hear it because it comes from God's word. I had a couple who I became friends with years ago here at Shoreline Church, wonderful couple, and they were living together. They were, they were living outside of God's plan for their sexuality. They were living together, they were sharing a bedroom, and they were sharing the bed. I won't say any more, but, that's, uh, but you know, they were living together. So, and so I knew him really well. I got to know her quite well over the couple of years, and for like three or four years, as we built a friendship as they were part of this church, we had different conversations about the way they were living because I was aware they were living together and they weren't married. And we had conversations about this isn't God's best plan for you. You really shouldn't be living this way. Why don't you guys consider either getting married or not living together? And we had lots of conversations. And here's the thing. They knew I was their pastor. They knew I loved them. They knew I totally disagreed with how they were living. And they felt comfortable to come to this church and keep listening and hearing God's word and being part of this church, even though they weren't living in a way they should be living. One time, many conversations over the years, one time I came, they were together, and I I said something to him. I said, said, hey, how are you doing? And this was his response. He goes, still living in sin. That's his response. Um, And I said, said, hey, I'm a pastor. I I I can marry you right now. And she goes, whoa, 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 whoa. She's like, whoa, whoa, slow down. I I said, I could, I could. And she's like, you know, she's like, whoa. But after a number of years of that, uh, they came to me and they said, you know what, we, we believe we need to get married. We need to do it right. They said, Pastor, would you marry us? And I said, I would be honored if you stop sleeping together until you get married. Seriously? <laughs> that was his voice if you didn't pick that up. Um, <laughs> he goes, seriously? I said, I said, I'm dead serious. I said, I love you. I care about you. And I want God's best for you. So if you will agree to not live in sin, I will agree to walk the, the road of walking with you towards getting married. I'd be honored to do your, your covenant of Christian marriage celebration. It's not just a legal document. It's a covenant before God. And they committed to do that. A couple months later, he came to me. He goes, this is really difficult. And I said, yeah. I, said I understand. I was engaged to my wife for a year before I married her. And there's times I had to fight her off like you can't imagine. <laughs> um, Strong Dutch woman, too. Um, aggressive. Anyway, that's a whole other sermon. That's like a conference. Um, but uh, but he, I said to him, I, but here's the thing. Can I tell you something? After, and, and for, for a whole season, they honored God's way, got married. And I cannot tell you how many times in the last, I think it's been about three or four years, maybe the last three years, one or the other has said to me, it is so good to live according to God's plan. This is so good for us. It is so much better. And I said, yeah. But can, can I tell you, as I share that with you, 
There's not one of us sitting in this room, there's not one person at home online that doesn't have some area that we're struggling with where God says, this is my perfect plan and we're struggling with how we care for our body or how we exercise or how we eat or what we view or, or how we treat people, how our mouth goes or, or in our sexuality. I mean, I don't sit up here, uh, you know, I'm judge, jury, and executioner. That's not, why, uh, that's not what a pastor's called to do. I'm called to speak the truth of God's word and to show grace because it's a journey for every one of us. But as I walked with that couple, they came to the point where they looked back and they said, oh, we wish we would have followed God's plan earlier. And in my own life, I can tell you the times where I've not been in line with God's will, and I come in line with God's will, it's always better. It's always life-giving. It's always rich. And so I share that with you just, just to say that, that as, as Jesus is speaking to the church at Thyatira, he's saying there's false teaching going on, and that false teaching is destroying your, your, your vertical, your relationship with God, and it's destroying your horizontal relationship with people. And he used idolatry and immorality, sexual immorality, as two examples. But any, that's what sin does. Sin separates us from God, and sin, sin separates us from people. Go back to, go back to Genesis chapter you know, 2, 3, and 4 and read it. When sin comes in, the, Adam and Eve are separate from God, but they become separate from each other. So when Jesus speaks to this church and says, be careful of false teaching, watch out for it. He's not doing it to be mean and steal people's fun. He's doing it out of love because he knows the best life for all of us, and we have to trust him. And so, so we learn this message that, that the problem with false teaching. And, and then as you continue on, what do you learn? What's the message that we learn from the letter to the church at Thyatira? That God always desires repentance over judgment. Jesus speaks to, about Jezebel, this false teacher, and her followers. And in both cases, you know what Jesus wants? He wants repentance. He doesn't want them to be judged. He wants them to turn away from their sin so they don't live with the consequences. Listen to what he says. Jesus says in verse 21 about Jezebel. And, and again, I don't, think this is Jez, I don't think her name is Jezebel. She's a person who's operating like the Old Testament. She was operating against God's desire, against God's will. I believe when it talks about her children, it's probably talking about her followers because what he says is, I'm going to bring destruction. I'm gonna, he, he says, I'm going to kill her. If she keeps doing this, I'm going to kill her children, basically. You go, wait, why would Jesus say that? Well, I, I, I believe that he's actually, and the Bible is actually very clear that, that God doesn't bring judgment for the next generation on the one before. Each person answers for their own lives and their own sins and their own faith. So I don't think that's what Jesus is saying, but I think he's saying to her, her children are her followers, and he says if they keep following her, keep doing what she's calling them to do and proposing that they do, it will be, it will be like a death sentence for them. They're destroying themselves. And so, but here's what he says. He says, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. What does Jesus want? Repentance. He wants her to turn from the way she's living, but she's not willing to. So he says, I will cast her on a bed of suffering. She'll have consequences. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. They'll have consequences unless they repent of her ways. You get it? He wanted her to repent. He wants her followers to repent. He wants us to, he doesn't want us to deal. If we keep running towards a cliff and Jesus calls us back and calls us to turn around, come the other way, that cliff may be a stupid decision financially. That cliff could be a stupid thing with how we care for our bodies. It could be all kinds of different things that we're not honoring him. He's going to say, stop, don't do that. He'll do all he can to call us to stop. But if we keep going, we can live with those consequences. He doesn't want that. He wants her to repent. He wants them to repent. But if they don't, there's consequences. And we're going to be talking about the topic of judgment. As you walk through the book of Revelation, you, you, you see the theme of judgment come through. In week eight of this series, we're going to focus on that topic of judgment and how God brings final judgment. But again, God's desire is redemption. And then another lesson, a fifth lesson. God will bring righteous and redemptive judgment if repentance is rejected. When we reject repentance, we refuse to follow him. God says, I will bring judgment for sin. If we know Jesus, that judgment falls on him. He paid the price. If we don't know Jesus, we take the judgment for our sins on ourselves. But God is perfectly holy and just, and so he will bring judgment. And then, God searches hearts, minds, and watches our actions. He does not look the other way. I thank God he doesn't look the other way. I thank God for the warnings he's given me along the way through my life. Helping me see that if I keep going on that path. Before I was a Christian, there was times that God, I think, I think I'm gonna look back one day from heaven and see all the times that God saved me from my own stupid stuff. But I thank God that he never takes his eyes off me or off you. So a question for you. What can you do to grow in your knowledge of God's word? and your commitment to his truth. One of the best things you can do is know this book. And can I tell you, I'm glad you come to church. I'm glad you like to hear sermons here. And when I preach, and, and when, when Dennis preaches, when Sean preaches, when uh, this night and next, next night of worship, Brandon's preaching for the first time. And when one of our team members preach, I hope you learn and grow in your faith. But if you want to grow in the word of God, here's what you do. You open this book every day and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. 
and you learn from God's word, it will transform your life. You will learn a whole lot more in six days of reading the Bible on your own or seven days of reading the Bible on your own than you will in a sermon once a week. And then if you add a sermon as like a bonus to that, you're really gonna be growing in your faith. So keep growing in God's word. And then getting a move on it. What I want to do is I want to just give some of the things that this, that this scripture calls us to. And will you listen to each of these declarations? And will you ask yourself, do I need to make this declaration today? Right now? Do I need to agree with this and say, God, this is for me? Here's the first one. We will keep moving forward and doing more than we did at first. Our journey of sanctification, becoming like Jesus, of spiritual growth. Will you say, God, I will keep moving forward. I want to keep growing to be more like Jesus. Can you pray that right now in your own heart? Can you say, God, I will keep moving forward. I'm not going to stay stagnant, tread water. I'm going to keep striving to be more like Jesus. He delights in that. He delighted in the church there. He delights in this in our lives. How about this? Will you say to God, we will recognize false teaching because we know the word of God. Say, will you say, God, I want to know your word so well that if, that if a teacher or a Sunday school leader or somebody in the world or something in the media comes my way and it's not true, I want to go, that's not true, this is the truth. We say, God, I want to know your word so well. I recognize false teaching. And false teaching can come from within the church. It can come from outside of the church. But you should recognize it because you know God's word <clears throat> so deeply. And there's a reason why here at Shoreline, um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's we, anyone who's going to teach children at Shoreline, they're going to go through a whole process of making sure that their beliefs are accurate and they're not going to mislead kids. And, 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 and Pastor Greg's going to take them through that process. Anyone who's going to teach or lead small groups with, with our, with our high school, middle school and high school kids. Uh, Brent, you've got a training today, right? Tra you know, training our leaders. You mean to train your leaders? Yes. Train them in the word. Train them in understanding the truth. And if somebody was teaching something that was false, our leaders would step in and deal with it. And here at Shoreline, we only bring in guest preachers that we know are going to preach the word of God. And with, with adult ministries, Bible study leaders, adult ministries, Sherry and a team of people check every single person before they teach to make sure they're online with God's word. And when our, when our lay members do teaching in those classes, and they do, they submit their teaching in advance, and then they actually bring it through Sherry and the team to make sure they're online with God's word. Why? Because it matters, amen? It matters what we teach. And so we'll recognize false teaching and we'll stand against it. We will repent of sexual immorality no matter how acceptable it might be in our world. God has said, this is how you flourish. This is what brings you life. And I tell people they're living outside of those boundaries that I talk to in the church, and I talk to people who, who struggle with all kinds of things. I tell them, stay here, keep coming here. You will be loved here, but you'll also be challenged. Like we're challenged in every area of our lives that we need to grow. We will repent of idolatry, no matter how common it is. I will not let anything take the place of God. No, no person, not myself, not my hobbies, not my political convictions, not what my friends believe, not money. Nothing. If anything takes the place above God, I drop it down. I say, God, you rule over all. Will you make that kind of commitment? We will search our hearts and minds and watch our deeds. We'll search our hearts. Say, Lord, I, am I walking with you? Am I following you? And then verse 25 calls us to de declare this. We will hold on to what we have until Jesus returns. We will hold on to what we have until he returns. Jesus, this is our prayer. In a world that floods us with false thinking and false teaching, we want to know your truth. And Lord, your word gives us that truth. I pray for each person listening today, whether they're online or on campus, that no person will listen and, and if they feel challenged because something came their way that disagrees with how they live their life, I pray they will not, that they will not shut down and not listen, but I pray that they'll go to your word, they'll grapple with scriptures, they'll call a pastor here and talk and pray and look at your word together. And Lord, we who name the name of Jesus want to follow the ways of Jesus, even when our natural inclinations may be against that. May the supernatural power of your presence, Jesus, Give us the strength we need to walk with you and follow you in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? I want to share one, give you one invitation, and then I want to uh, send you off with a word of blessing. And here's the invitation. Uh, we have an event coming up on October 30th, uh, kind of this, uh, fest this fall festival, this uh, celebration, and it's for kids. It's all outdoors. And we're going to have stuff like this. We're going to have kid-friendly games, trunk or treat, crafts, pumpkin painting, food trucks, inflatable slides. The big screen that's out there, the 20-foot screen, will be fun, kid-friendly video games that they're going to play on a 20-foot screen. All kinds of stuff for kids. 
invite your own kids, invite your grandkids, invite neighbor kids to come and be part of that. And then if you could serve, uh, bring some bags of candy in the next, uh, be, between now and then and just drop them off at the Connection Center and the big bins there so we have candy for the kids. Um, if you can volunteer at the event, we still need 55 people as, as of the beginning of first service, 55 more volunteers. It would be such a blessing to the kids for you to just to show up and help out, help out with one of the games, have fun with the kids. It's, it's a you know, three-hour time frame. Come, be part of that. Uh, again, donate candy, in any way you can be part of that. I'm excited because my wife announced to me what my outfit's going to be, what my uh, costume's going to be, and there's nothing I love more than somebody else putting me in a, in a costume. So uh, you'll get to see if you show up on that day, and uh, it'll be, it's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, but I want to send you off with a word of blessing. I want to let you know if you want prayer, if you're at home and you want prayer, on the screen you see that email address. You can send us your prayer needs, and our prayer team will pray for you. Or if you call the number you see on the screen, they'll pray for you right now. And if you're here in the, in, on the campus, anywhere on campus, come in here. And we have people on both sides, yes, that are ready to pray for you. So we got prayer teams all along the walls. Uh, come on inside, be prayed for. And if you're new at Shoreline, thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us online on campus. And if you're online and you're new, just text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen, and we will connect with you online. And if you're on campus, all you need to do is go by the Connection Center right through the lobby, go in there and say, I'm new, and they want to give you a little gift bag. Thank you for coming and answer your questions and give you a, a warm personal welcome. As I close our time together this morning, um, I was just uh, reading, reading God's word. Not for you, not for the church, just for God to teach me. And as I was reading the scriptures, I was, I'm going through Romans, so I was in Romans 11. And as I came across this little doxology, this, this word of praise at the end of Romans 11, it was just like God put on my heart, that's how you close the service today. I had something else in mind, but when I read this, it was like God said, that's the closing word. So just quiet your heart and let these words just by the Spirit of God kind of fill your heart and kind of come over your life. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll be back continuing in Revelation next week. Have a great week.